Tonight, civil war reenactment? Is this just idle chatter among President Trump's supporters about civil war? Or something to take seriously after a volatile election in 2020? My conversation with former National Security Council official under Donald Trump, Fiona Hill. Plus, what's with the GOP's obsession with pricey monoclonal antibody treatments for COVID? Haven't they heard about this vaccine that's super effective and, oh yeah, free? And later, Columbus Day Revisited. For the first time, an American president observes Indigenous Peoples Day, the lesser known and untold part of the American pageant. Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. In 1991, a professor of public policy named Jack Goldston published a weighty book in which he argued that elitism, inequality and political obstructionism could lead the United States into decline, instability, populism and the rise of an America first leader who could sow a whirlwind of conflict. Sound familiar? Two decades later, an evolutionary anthropologist named Peter Turchin used Goldstone's model to argue that the US was already in a second gilded age, one that he predicted would culminate in a period of violent instability around the year, wait for it, 2020. If those predictions sound eerily accurate to you, wait for what Goldstone and Turchin predicted next. Welcome to the turbulent 20s, they wrote together last year, just before the election. Quote, is the US likely headed for still greater protests and violence? In a word, yes. They wrote, our model shows there is plenty of dangerous tinder piled up and any spark could generate an inferno. In short, their model now predicted civil war. I know what you're gonna say. Civil war, Mehdi, really calm down. Sure, Trump's awful. Sure, the GOP backs up his big election lie. But the Civil War was the bloodiest conflict in this nation's history. Three quarters of a million Americans dead. Surely we're not facing anything like that. Well, somebody had better tell that to hardcore Republican voters. They're turning into a totalitarian government by trying to force somebody to take a vaccine as the whole border is just, people are flooding in. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I know our government is way out of control. We're just sick of it, you know, and we're not going to, we're not going to take it anymore. I see a civil war coming. I do. I see civil war coming. But Mehdi, you'll say that was just a Trump support at his Iowa rally over the weekend. The thing is, she's hardly alone. Last week, Ryan Williams, the president of the ultra-conservative pro-Trump Claremont Institute, told The Atlantic that he was preparing grudgingly for political violence. Quote, I worry about such a conflict. The Civil War was terrible. It should be the thing we try to avoid almost at all costs. Sorry, what? Almost? Almost at all costs? Why would a conservative thought leader suggest that civil war isn't always the worst thing that could happen to America? Shouldn't be avoided at all costs. I guess Ryan Williams is just saying out loud what plenty of conservatives are thinking, imagining, maybe even fantasizing about. Take right-wing town hall columnist Kurt Schlichter, who makes a comfortable living writing violent action novels about a conflict between red and blue states with titles like The Split, Collapse, and People's Republic his shorthand for the communist state of California in this dystopian future. Well, look at the Trump-loving Michigan militia members who were arrested last year for attempting to kidnap and possibly murder Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer. The FBI says those men hoped their extremist efforts would help to spur a civil war. Well, look to Donald Trump himself. In the lead-up to his first impeachment trial, Trump happily, quote, tweeted a conservative pastor who suggested that removing the president from office would provoke a civil war. Trump was mocked mercilessly by liberals on Twitter for that tweet. But you know who didn't laugh? Armed militia members who passed Trump's tweets around like the gospel, including the Oath Keepers, many of whom later turned out for Trump at the Capitol insurrection. Look, Trump always says terrible things that shock us. But when he says them again a year later, six months later even, Americans collectively shrug because they've been desensitized to his dangerous rhetoric. We in the media constantly face this dilemma. When reporting on Trump's outrageous statements, are we just amplifying them, normalizing them, numbing the American public to them? The thing is, we have to talk about them. 
not just because he's probably the 2024 GOP presidential nominee, but because things are different now, worse. A recent poll found that 41% of Biden voters and 52% of Trump voters agreed that it was time for some states to secede from the union. And over the summer, a University of Chicago study estimated that 21 million Americans believe Joe Biden is an illegitimate president and Trump should be returned to office by force. And that study pointed out that many of those Americans are armed. Even the staid Brookings Institution threw up warning signals last month, quote, we should not assume it could not happen and ignore the ominous signs that conflict is spiraling out of control. Signs like, I don't know, a Republican member of Congress seeming to threaten violence over non-existent election fraud. They will never like us. They want to destroy what we believe in. The Second Amendment was written so that we can fight against tyranny. Yep. If our election systems continue to be rigged and continue to be stolen, then it's, it's going to lead to one place, and that's bloodshed. And I will tell you, as much as I am willing to defend our liberty at all costs, there's nothing that I would dread doing more than having to pick up arms against a fellow American. Cawthorn's almost glorification of violence there also highlights why civil war is possible here in America in a way where, where you know, it's not discussed the same way in other countries that have similar social divisions or a similar far right on the rise, say a Great Britain or a France. Because in America, unlike in those countries, people also own hundreds of millions of guns. And many of those armed Americans take the ex-president very seriously when he praises an insurrectionist killed in the capital violence as he did this past weekend. We must all demand justice for Ashley and her family. So on this solemn occasion, as we celebrate her life, we renew our call for a fair and nonpartisan investigation into the death of Ashley Babbitt. Of all the people shot by the police over the past year, it's funny that Trump chooses to glorify and single out for special attention a woman who joined in what the FBI called a terrorist attack on the US Capitol. But, you know, that's what Trump does and people listen. Like the GOP House member in North Carolina who threatened last week to storm an election office in Democratic heavy Durham County to take their voting machines. He later backed off from that threat while telling a local reporter that he's not sure Joe Biden won the election. Maybe he's just repeating what he sees, not just Trump saying, but Republican leaders in Washington. Are we going to follow what the Constitution says or not? I hope we get back to what the Constitution says, but clearly in a number of states, they didn't follow those legislatively. So you think rules. the election was so stolen? I, I, stolen? I, what I said is there are states that didn't follow their legislatively set rules. Yes, that's House GOP whip Steve Scalise evading questions about who won the election, an oh, election that Joe Biden won, to be clear. Part of the Republican rolling coup attempt I told you about on this show yesterday night. Scalise is floating a trial balloon for shutting down future elections to preserve the Constitution. But what we haven't talked about is what happens after Republicans pull that card at the next presidential election, especially if Donald Trump is their candidate. Whether or not that plot fails, we still have to contend with Trump himself and his movement. Trump, a man who has the power to get his supporters, his movement into the streets. A man who has glorified and incited violence. And if the plot succeeds, do we think Democrats are just going to sit at home and accept an election stolen in plain sight? In January 2020, American democracy dodged a bullet. We got lucky. But how long can America's luck hold out? Is a second civil war in the offing? A question I'm astonished that I even have to ask. Or is this anti-Trump alarmism? Is this an exaggeration of the undeniable threat that American democracy still faces? To discuss all of this, joining me now is Jack Goldstone, the theorist who predicted the current unrest in the US. He's a professor of public policy at George Mason University and the author of Revolutions, A Very Short Introduction. Also with us is Ruth ben Ghiat, professor of history and Italian studies at NYU and author of Strong Men Mussolini to the Present. I can't think of two better people to talk about all of this with. Jack, let me start with you. You and your co-author, Peter Turchin, have said on a few occasions, hey, this is as much about inequality as it is about Donald Trump. Explain what you mean by that. Well, people think of the Civil War as just being about slavery, but that wasn't all it was about. That was the big issue. But remember, it started 
after a disputed election. The southern states simply decided that the election of Abraham Lincoln was intolerable. It was going, as uh, Representative Cawthorn said, that that was going to be an attack on their values. Southern states said, we have a constitutional right to have slavery in our states, so we have to preserve the Constitution by ignoring the results of this election. That is where we see parallels to what's happening now. Inequality is obviously different today. We talk more about inequality of income and wealth, which has become enormous. Um, but there are real grievances out there. And to say, how close are we to civil war? Could it happen here? You listen to the statements that are being made. They're preparing for state legislatures to deny the validity of an election. Now, just think about this. What if there's an attack, say, on the Michigan State House, like there was on the Capitol January 6th? The governor is pushed out, the legislature takes control, and they declare that they think the election of Joe Biden was invalid, so they're no longer going to follow laws that are signed by Biden as a not legitimate president of the United States. What happens then? Does the government have to send the military to retake Michigan? I mean, at that point, we're in civil war once again. So it's a very so just, near, very realistic possibility as long as we have this deep polarization and this anguish about uh, people being so deeply unhappy with their lives. So just to be clear, Jack, according to your thesis, you're saying there are these factors, including inequality, which are the tinder. And where, what is Trump's role here? He is the person throwing the matches on the fire. I mean, what is, what is his role? Well, he, he's the uh, arsonist in a, you know, in a forest that's been undergoing uh, deep stress for a long time. Remember, inequality is worse now than any time since the late 19th century. Um, and we have many different kinds of inequality, unfortunately, that are reinforcing each other. We have income inequality, especially severe for uh, older white males and those without college. But we also have inequality afflicting uh, minorities, and we have inequality among different regions, urban versus rural areas and different states. So it's very easy yeah. for many people in this country to say, I'm not getting a fair shake. Things are not working out right for me. And it's because the government has done something wrong and we have to change it. Ruth, earlier I mentioned a study by University of Chicago political scientist Robert Pape, who's been on this show as well, suggesting 21 million Americans could be primed for future insurrectionist violence. Uh, this is what he said on the show when he was on. Have a listen. It is substantial, and it's very important that we understand that the current state of the insurrectionist movement in America today is at least as large as it was before the January 6th insurrection attack on the Capitol. Ruth, you are someone who has studied this stuff for a while. You and I have discussed this many a time on this show. How worried are you when you hear statistics like that, that 21 million Americans not only believe Biden is illegitimate, but are willing to use force to restore the person they believe is the legitimate president? Oh, of course, I'm, I'm, high, I'm very worried. And the wild card is, with respect to other countries uh, that can descend into sectarian violence, are the hundreds of millions of guns in private hands, right? And, and the emphasis placed on guns as patriotism and guns as freedom. But I also want to call attention to who is benefiting from this rhetoric. So... You know, we know at the geopolitical level that Putin's dream is to have the U.S. implode from within like the USSR did. And we know there's a right-wing playbook that goes back to the military coups of, you know, the 60s and 70s, where you, you depict the democratically elected government, in this case Biden, as so riven by uh, chaos and incompetence and so tyrannical that an insurrection, be it January the 6th or something larger, becomes a patriotic act. But the end game is to install, the end game is not civil war in itself. That's a means to an end for somebody like Trump and Bannon. The end game is installing an authoritarian uh, you know, regime, whatever that looks like today, which is justified as returning to order after all the chaos. Jack, just coming back to the Civil War thesis, a lot of people watching, many people who are concerned about Trump, think that Donald Trump is going to try and steal the election. They might still say to you, come on, though, hold on. 
that's bad and that's dangerous, but we're not on the verge of civil war. That is a step too far. At what point does it become alarmist to talk about the potential for political violence? For example, we could believe that there's going to be another insurrection at the Capitol. There might even be more political violence, acts of domestic terror. We're seeing people turn up at the Capitol in greater regularity, trying to blow stuff up. But as bad as that gets, that's still not a civil war, is it? Well, you don't want to sleepwalk into a civil war by not seeing the trouble brewing. And as Ruth will tell you, you can see all the signs of it well underway. Um, I don't think it's alarmist at all. Imagine if after Timothy McVeigh had blown up the Oklahoma federal building, that a former president said, you know, he's a great patriot and I'm really proud of what he did. Yes. And we need to stand for his cause. And there weren't that many people who were really hurt. It wasn't that bad. And then that former president is backed by hundreds of other officials around the country. That's about where we are with regard to what happened on January 6th. You have an official endorsement of a terrorist act as a patriotic good deed. So I don't think it's too alarmist to say this is building up. People are encouraging it. When you have someone as established as Senator Grassley in Iowa stand up next to uh, former President Trump, He's, he's saying, yeah. I support this guy. I, I'm with him. And that legitimizes Trump all the more. So the more the Republican Party no, depends on Trump, the more legitimacy that this cause gains. It's a good point. There has never been a former president or a sitting president praising an insurrectionist or domestic terrorist, not in modern American history, for sure. Uh, Ruth, one last quick question. How much about the Trump movement, MAGA, QAnon, the Sh QAnon shaman, uh, Trump himself is cartoonish, is ridiculous, and makes us numb to the dangers of actual political violence that stems from this movement? Well, that, that's, a, that's a danger, but I would point out that uh, you know, all the dictators, including Hitler and Mussolini, were dismissed as buffoons, as crazy yes. people who ranted. And that was one reason that, uh, you know, people didn't take them seriously. But the other reason it's uh, important, uh, it's not alarmist to speak about this, is because we, there are things we need to be doing now. We need to be shoring up the law enforcement and military to get rid of extremists, because if things do start heading towards civil conflict, the military, the National Guard, and police, all of those bodies, uh, they, they're very, they're, what they do is very fateful. That is a very good point. Shoring up our democracy. If only uh, more Senate Democrats were paying attention. Jack Goldston, Ruth ben Giat, a fascinating, if disturbing, discussion. Appreciate both of your time. It's not just academics or historians or liberal lefties who are warning about the dangers that come from Donald Trump and his movement. It's also the woman who served at the side of the hawkish John Bolton in Donald Trump's White House. Many will remember Fiona Hill's turn as a key witness in the inquiry that gathered evidence ahead of Trump's first impeachment trial. And as the author of a new memoir, Americans should now pay close attention to the object lesson being offered by the former Russia and Europe advisor at the National Security Council. We should be listening to her. It's not Putin himself, she says, that she fears as the biggest threat to US democracy, but that the US could become another Russia politically. Quote, Russia is America's ghost of Christmas future, a harbinger of things to come if we can't adjust course and heal our political polarization. No state, no matter how advanced, is immune from flawed leaderships, he says. The erosion of political checks and balances and the degradation of its institutions. Democracy is not self-repairing, she says. It requires constant attention and renewal, especially during periods of rapid technological and social change and economic uncertainty. There are paragraphs and paragraphs like that in her book, pages and pages, where she notes the parallels between Russia's slide to autocracy in the past three decades and the slow coup that is still rolling here in the US. Hill's book is called There Is Nothing For You Here. They are the words her father gave her when the coal mines closed and the manufacturing jobs moved elsewhere in the town she's from in northeast England. But Hill says the same educational and career opportunities she was able to take advantage of when she emigrated to the US no longer exist here. Something, as Jack Goldston just pointed out, that Trump was able to exploit. I spoke to Dr. Hill last night on MSNBC. Here now is more from our conversation. 
Fiona, you write of the insurrection, quote, Donald Trump's presidency was both a product and a symptom of the set of complex problems intertwined beneath the surface of our polity. If we fail to fix our ailing society by not addressing them and providing opportunity for all, another American president, just like Vladimir Putin, might decide to stay in power indefinitely, and the next insurrectionary force that invades the US Capitol building might be better prepared than the January 6, 2021 mob. They might just manage to hold it, a kind of... Whew, dark prospect. How worried were you when you were working for Trump that he might try to be a president for life? And how worried are you about the prospect of Trump or a similar authoritarian trying to grab hold of that in 2024 and beyond? I became increasingly worried about it over time. And I mean, really, the alarm bells were going off in my head at the very point when I left the National Security Council. So I left just before the fateful phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky of Ukraine, which essentially laid it all out. When President Trump asked Zelensky to launch investigations into Joe Biden, who he assumed, of course, would be the presidential candidate that he would have to go up against in the 2020 elections. And after that, and of course, in my experiences in the first impeachment trial, it became evident, crystal clear to me, and I think to an awful lot of other people by this point as well, that Donald Trump intended to play incredibly dirty, to stay in power and to essentially win or even uh, you know, falsifies, we've seen him attempting to do, the results of the 2020 election. I mean, he has refused to admit that he lost that election in 2020. He continues to tell yeah. the people who support him that he won it. And I mean, we are now in a different kind of territory, particularly after January 6th and uh, the mob that stormed the Capitol building. We're in the territory of other countries, in the territory of Russia, for example, that has seen these kinds of things happen throughout its history. Yes. Yes. And... Your book is fascinating. You tell your story, your life story. It's a memoir. It's political analysis. You mentioned in there that you're not partisan. You've never been partisan. You talked about public service earlier. It, but isn't the reality that this issue of racism, fascism, autocracy that we see in America right now, it isn't an issue of both sides. This is an issue solely of the Republican Party and the Republican base, and that's been festering for years, nurtured as much by the likes of George Bush and Karl Rove, who you worked with back in, whatever it was, 2006, 7, 8, as Donald Trump and Steve Bannon. We need to be honest about that, don't we, clear-eyed? Well, look, we've seen the perversion of the Republican Party. I mean, I think an awful lot of people who I know who are, um, in fact, uh, Republicans, don't recognise the party that they joined or the party that they supported. So what we've seen is a kind of factionalism within that party. Again, this is very typical, unfortunately, of uh, parties that kind of lose their bearings. The ideology has disappeared, the conservatism, the uh, coherence of this. And it is, as you're describing now, starting to look like the kind of charismatic cults that we've seen in other places. Everybody in the party now who wants to stay in power is being forced to, to demonstrate fealty to Donald Trump. And Trump himself is not an ideologue. He's not a conservative. Um, he has a few views, but there isn't any coherent political ideology behind him. I mean, I saw that very clearly as well. And so I think we have to call that out as well, is that we've seen the deterioration and the disintegration of the Republican Party. It's much more of a movement now than it was before. And again, this is very typical yeah. of other countries that have gone down an authoritarian and autocratic path, the deterioration of a mainstream grassroots Quick. party. We're out of time. Quick last second, 30 seconds left. Why do you think America is a place where you, I'm a British immigrant, you're a British immigrant, we're both Americans. Why do you think America is a better place for opportunity than England, you say in the book? Well, it has been uh, for all of this uh, particular period. But I think, you know, one of the reasons for writing the book to sound the alarm is what you and I and many others as immigrants who have come here have seen happen over the last several years. Between, you know, this um, period that we're talking now in 2008, 2009, the Great Recession, a lot of that opportunity has um, faded away. Uh, there's a great deal of socioeconomic crisis and grievance and COVID. The pandemic has really had a very negative impact, as we all know, uh, on uh, Russian, on um, sorry, U.S. society and economy. And you know, this is a yes. basically a clarion call for how do we fix this? How do we move forward and put that opportunity that you and I and many others have taken advantage of back again? Well put, uh, Fiona Hill, author of There Is Nothing for You Here. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Still ahead, far-right Republican and unvaccinated Texan, Texas gubernatorial candidate Alan West keeps up his anti-vax crusade even after contracting COVID, now pushing an expensive experimental treatment to own Big Pharma, I guess. 
How did this become a thing among Republicans? That's next in 60 Seconds. Republican firebrand and far-right former Congressman Alan West unleashed a series of tweets over the weekend after announcing he and his wife had contracted COVID. Days earlier, the unvaccinated Texas gubernatorial candidate attended a political fundraiser at the Lakewood Yacht Club, where, as you can see there, not a mask in sight. Side note, if you were there, you may want to get tested. But West, who is running for the Texas GOP gubernatorial nomination because he doesn't think Greg Abbott is right-wing enough, didn't let a small thing like the coronavirus get in the way of his anti-vaccination mission and message, tweeting, Yesterday, my wife Angela and I underwent monoclonal antibody therapy in Dallas. The results were immediate. Angela was released to go home, but there were concerns of COVID-related pneumonia for me. He even tweeted this, My, checks, my chest x-rays do show COVID pneumonia. Not serious. I'm probably going to be admitted to the hospital. Yeah, sure. Didn't sound serious at all. In an earlier tweet, West said his wife was vaccinated, and as he said, she was released to go home. But West, who, remember, is unvaccinated, was admitted to the hospital because his symptoms were worse than his vaccinated wife. I mean, what does that tell you, Alan? Can no one save this anti-vaxxer from himself? Nope. He came back to Twitter to say this. I can attest that after this experience, I'm even more dedicated to fighting against vaccine mandates. Instead of enriching the pockets of big pharma and corrupt bureaucrats and politicians, we should be advocating the monoclonal antibody infusion therapy. Hold on, Alan West. Can you really be that ignorant? The infusion therapy, like the vaccine, was also created by Big Pharma, by the multi-billion dollar company Regeneron. It's also been approved by the government for distribution under emergency use authorization, like the Moderna and J&J &J COVID vaccines, and unlike the Pfizer vaccine, which is now fully authorized. Monoclonal antibody therapy is also a year-old laboratory-created drug that's no less experimental than, you guessed it, the COVID vaccine. The infusion costs more than $2,000 per dose, that's up to 200 times more than the vaccine, which costs between 10 to 20 bucks per dose. So much for not enriching Big Pharma. And yet West is far from the first Republican or anti-vaccine crusader to tout the antibody treatment. Demand for this infusion treatment is soaring in less vaccinated and often GOP-led southern states. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Christian Ramers told The Times that the treatment is clogging up our healthcare resources. He says pushing antibodies while playing down vaccines is like investing in car insurance without investing in brakes. So how do monoclonal antibodies fit into the wider fight against this coronavirus? And why focus on them over the vaccines that we have? Here to discuss is Dr. Christian Ramers, an infectious disease specialist and assistant health director at Family Health Centers of San Diego. He's also associate clinical professor at UC San Diego School of Medicine. Dr. Ramers, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Explain to us how the monoclonal antibodies treatment works and what type of patients are given the treatment. Is it just a simple substitute for or alternative to the vaccine? Well, it's certainly not. And I think you hit all the points of why it is not in the, in the lead up to this interview. Uh, basically, the monoclonal antibodies are taking a little shortcut. We're giving these antibodies to people that are already sick. And by the time somebody has the SARS-CoV-2 virus in their body and they're developing COVID-19, it's a race of the virus against the immune response. And those antibodies are just a real shortcut. But a better way to be prepared for that uh, race is to have a vaccine so that your immune system gets the head start right away. Antibodies are also just a temporary fix. They're in the body and then out within 90 days and don't really necessarily give any long-lasting immunity like a vaccine would. So is there any logic to these mostly unvaccinated states in the South preferring the infusion over the vaccine? We hear Ron DeSantis in Florida, Greg Abbott in Texas, singing the praises of monoclonal antibodies in a way they don't about the vaccine. Not really. And you, you went through some of the economics of it as well. You know, $20 of the vaccine would have prevented most of these cases. Uh, and it's not only sort of $2,000 that the taxpayers have already paid for for these monoclonal therapies, but they're hard to give. You know, we have six staff in my clinic right behind me here, and we're working as hard as we can to get 25 infusions done over a day. Uh, whereas, you know, many, many more vaccines, they say that, you know, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's very, very true in this case. And I think the reason this was done is that these governors had really gone against vaccines. And this was sort of their plan B when they started seeing their case numbers yes. really go up. These therapies are great. They do keep people out of the hospital. Uh, they probably save lives. We think that it takes about 12 infusions to save a single life. And so it was thankfully a plan B that to save people's lives, but really not a very smart strategy. 
and it's not preventative, as you point out in that brilliant quote analogy in The Times, uh, it's car insurance rather than actually the brakes. Um, in that piece, The New York Times also reports that a growing number of vaccinated patients are now receiving the infusion too. Why do we think vaccinated people are in need of the infusion? Yeah, well, we have kind of a bimodal distribution, you could say. We have a whole lot of unvaccinated people that are just really, really sick, and they get scared and, and want to use whatever, whether it's approved or not, that can save their lives. But then you have a lot of very vulnerable people in their 60s and 70s and with underlying medical conditions, and they want to take whatever they can uh, to keep them safe. Many of those people may have had waning immunity from getting a vaccine a, a while ago. And so, they, you know, this is the best treatment that we have, reducing their chance of getting sick by about 80%. Dr. Ramos, one last question. One last Merck question. has asked the Merck. FDA to authorize the anti-COVID pill. Uh, it would be the first pill shown to treat the illness. Do you see a scenario where there are options to fight COVID other than with a vaccine? Or will the vaccine always be the main surefire way to stop this pandemic? The vaccine is always better. You know, it's so much better to be prepared. Your body has already seen the protein and can mount a very good and strong response right away. I actually have some concerns with this medication. We need to see the data. We need to see how safe it is. Uh, there's a you know possibility that it may not be safe in certain populations. Uh, so maybe another useful tool in the toolkit, but of course vaccines are so much better and they've saved hundreds of thousands of lives already. It has indeed. Dr. Christian Ramos, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate your analysis and insights. Still ahead. They've been accused by some for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of civilians around the world. No, I'm not talking about despots or dictators abroad. I'm talking about former US secretaries of state. So why is our current secretary of state, our current top diplomat, posing happily for photos with this trio? That's next in 60 seconds. Don't go away. You've heard me say it before on this show. There isn't much accountability in Washington, D.C. No real consequences for those who are accused of committing crimes or abuses of power, especially overseas. Check this picture out. Here is the current Democratic Secretary of State showing off a photo he took with three former Republican secretaries of state at a memorial for a fourth, George Shultz, who recently passed away. From left to right, with Blinken, a Condoleezza Rice, National Security Advisor and Secretary of State under George W. Bush, Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor and Secretary of State under Richard Nixon, and James Baker, Secretary of State under George H. W. Bush. It is difficult to quantify how much suffering and death the people in this picture are accused of being responsible for. James Baker was a prime mover behind the first Gulf War, which ended Saddam Hussein's occupation of Kuwait. The message that I conveyed from President Bush and our coalition partners was that Iraq must either comply with the will of the international community and withdraw peacefully from Kuwait or be expelled by force. But that was the good war with Iraq, wasn't it? In which Saddam Hussein did all the killing of innocents, right? Not quite. In 1992, Beth DuPont, a, dem a demographer at the Commerce Department, estimated that 158,000 Iraqis, including 39,000 women and 32,000 children, died in the US-led war or its immediate aftermath. She was promptly dismissed from her job in the Bush senior administration. That was the war that Baker supported and pushed for. But he's maybe junior varsity compared to the other two former secretaries of state in that picture. Because Iraq was devastated again by the U.S., invaded and occupied in 2003. And Condoleezza Rice was a driving force behind that illegal invasion. And the WMD lies used to justify it. The problem here is that there will always be some uncertainty about uh, how quickly he can acquire a nuclear weapon. But we don't want the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud. The civilian death toll from the invasion of Iraq has been estimated at everything from 200,000 to 400,000, possibly even more. We may never know how many innocents were killed there as a result of Rice's war. Don't forget the torture either. According to the Senate Intelligence Report, Condoleezza Rice signed off on the CIA's enhanced interrogation techniques, including sleep deprivation and, yes, waterboarding. In 2015, Human Rights Watch called for Rice to be investigated for conspiracy to torture as well as other crimes. And then there is Henry Kissinger. Arrest Henry Kissinger for war crimes! Arrest Henry Kissinger for war crimes! Where to?
to begin with Henry Kissinger. As Anthony Bourdain famously put it, witness what Henry did in Cambodia, the fruits of his genius for statesmanship, and you will never understand why he's not sitting in the dock at The Hague next to Milosevic. But Yale University historian Greg Grandin, who wrote a book on Kissinger, goes much further, saying Nixon's right-hand man prolonged the Vietnam War for five pointless years, illegally bombed Cambodia and Laos, and bore responsibility for three genocides in Cambodia, East Timor, and Bangladesh. A full tally hasn't been done, says Grandin, but a back-of-the-envelope count would attribute three, maybe four million deaths to Kissinger's actions. Three, maybe four million deaths. This is the guy Blinken is hobnobbing with. And of course, he isn't the first Democratic Secretary of State to befriend the architect of those horrors in Southeast Asia. Hillary Clinton used to brag about her friendship with Kissinger during the 2016 Democratic presidential primaries. This is how her then opponent, Senator Bernie Sanders, responded. She talked about getting the approval or the support or the mentoring of Henry Kissinger. Now, I find it rather amazing because I happen to believe that Henry Kissinger was one of the most destructive secretaries of state in the modern history of this country. I am proud to say that Henry Kissinger is not my friend. I will not take advice from Henry Kissinger. Well, I know journalists have asked who you do listen to on foreign policy, and we have yet to know who that is. Well, it ain't Henry I, Kissinger, that's, that's for fine. sure. If only more people in our politics and our media were willing to speak out like that about some of the truly awful things that our former top officials have done abroad and not look past war crimes or human rights abuses in the name of bipartisanship or patriotism. We have to be honest about what our country has done around the world as a result of the actions of the people in that picture. Secretary of State Blinken is relatively new to the job, but the reality is this. If you're happy to cozy up to Baker Rice, and especially Kissinger, people who many would say have much blood on their hands, who have been credibly accused of so many war crimes, then I'm sorry you really have no right to ever lecture any other country, government, or foreign official on human rights or respect for human life ever again. When we come back, a Columbus Day unlike any other, back in 90 seconds. Today marks a holiday, or two holidays, I should say, that shed light on one of America's most contentious legacies. What's historically been Columbus Day is now also, for the first time in US history, being recognized as Indigenous Peoples Day by an American president. On Friday, Joe Biden issued the first ever presidential pro proclamation, excuse me, of Indigenous Peoples Day. It's a big deal, the federal government refocusing this federal holiday away from celebrating just Christopher Columbus towards a greater appreciation of America's indigenous communities. And it's about time. There's no question of Columbus's genocidal legacy in the Americas towards Native Americans, from enslaving them to murdering them en masse. And yet his name is on state capitals and cities across the country. He's still the third most venerated figure in terms of the number of US monuments and memorials, only behind Abraham Lincoln and George Washington. That's according to the think tank Monument Lab. Last year's protests after George Floyd's killing re-energized the conversation around America's indigenous communities as well. Cities across America saw Columbus statues come down, often amid protest. By some counts, at least 30 of them. Sports teams like the Cleveland Guardians and the Washington football team finally took the step to get rid of their Native American-themed mascots after years of pressure. And President Biden's continued the conversation. He made it a point to include indigenous communities in his executive order on racial equity upon coming to office. I'm directing the federal agency to reinvigorate the consultation prog uh, process with Indian tribes. Respect the tribal sovereignty. Respect for tribal sovereignty will be a cornerstone of our engaging with Native American communities. He also appointed Deb Holland as Secretary of Interior, making her the first Native American in the nation's 200-year history to serve as a cabinet secretary. But no discussion about the historic injustices towards minority communities, communities is complete without addressing the current onslaught of voter suppression bills targeting those communities, including Native Americans. Take Montana. The sprawling Blackfeet reservation is roughly the size of Delaware, but it only has two election offices and four ballot drop-off locations, one open just 14 hours a day. According to the New York Times, other reservations in Montana have no polling places at all, meaning residents must go to the county seat to vote, 
and many don't have cars or can't afford to take time off. Activists have filed lawsuits against two laws passed by Montana's Republican-controlled House. One would prohibit organized ballot collection, which has been essential to voters who live in areas with limited mail service. Another would eliminate same-day voter registration. There's also the issue of many voters having their registration tossed out for not having traditional addresses. It happened to 500 Navajo voters in 2012 when election officials said their addresses were too obscure. And in states like North Dakota, there have been attempts to block tribe-issued IDs from being recognized, which the tribes eventually overturned. Remember, this is a voting bloc that matters. Take the all-important swing state of Arizona in 2020. A surge in the Native American vote is said to have been crucial to Biden's victory in the Grand Canyon state. So yes, Biden's historic proclamation that today is Indigenous People's Day is a great move. But in the current climate of our underfired democracy, if he's not going to protect their access to voting, if Congress doesn't pass legislation like the Freedom to Vote Act and protect Native Americans' ability to actually participate in America's democracy, how much is naming a holiday really worth? Joining me now to discuss this is writer and analyst Julian Brave Noisecat, who's a member of the Kanim Lake Band Seskesin. He's currently vice president of policy and strategy at Data for Progress. And Jenny Monet, and an investigative journalist and author of the weekend newsletter Indigenously. She's a tribal citizen of the Laguna Pueblo. Thank you both uh, for joining me this evening. Uh, Jenny, let me start with you. What does it mean to have President Biden officially proclaim October the 11th as Indigenous People's Day, especially coming after Donald Trump, who called Christopher Columbus an intrepid hero and accused radical activists of attacking this great historic figure? Well, I think Indian country is just applauding this step. Um, I think there are other big steps that could happen. Um, you know, this is um, part of a three decades long push to uh, really reframe the narrative of one that is a little bit more accurate to the history of the colonization of this country. And that simply cannot be ignored without the indigenous narrative. Um, you know, the real push behind Indigenous Peoples Day uh, began on the 500th anniversary of Columbus's journey uh, from 1492 um, in 1992, largely to the credit of people like um, Oglala newsman Tim Gallego, who worked with Governor Mickelson in South Dakota to actually invoke the first Native American day, um, which is yeah. now law. And, uh, you know, to see so these strides that are being made, um, a proclamation is great. Hundreds of cities across the country and even states make these proclamations year after year. And I think that if we're truly to uh, be serious about the reframing of the historical yes. narrative of the country, I think more people would like to see um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day be a complete replacement of Columbus Day. Uh, very good point. Julian, President Biden also appointed Deb Haaland to his cabinet, something you campaigned loudly for, including on this show, I remember. Uh, he's talking about strengthening tribal sovereignty. Uh, nine months into his presidency, has he done a lot, in your view, with regard to indigenous people um, in terms of addressing centuries-long injustices, or are you disappointed at the rate of progress? Well, let the seed kwa kelmuko ui meri happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I just want to say my my people's name is the Tik uh, I know it's a mouthful to pronounce, so apologies for there was, having I, to get I you apologize. to pronounce that. I apologize. I'm bad at pronunciations, and I was never going to get that one right, so I apologize. No, but thank it's you all right. I, for clarifying I, it's, for our it viewers. It happens every time. Uh, it's also great to see Jenny on on your program. Jenny's a wonderful <laughs> journalist and a good colleague. Um, Let's see. Well, first, I'd just say that, uh, you know, for indigenous peoples, uh, Columbus was lost and round here every day used to belong to the Indians. Um, but to your question about President Biden, you know, I think that uh, the Biden administration has obviously taken significant steps to uh, have native representation in the highest levels of government. We obviously now have the first ever Native American cabinet secretary, uh, Secretary Deb Holland, who is a Secretary of Interior, a uh, department that oversees about a fifth of the nation's landmass, a uh, very significant fraction of its natural resources, as well as the nation-to-nation -nation relationship with the 576 federally recognized tribes across the country. And there are many other stories like Secretary Holland's at other levels of government you know, below at sort of um, Assistant Secretary uh, department head, all sorts of other positions. And that's obviously a very important step. I think it's really important, though, to keep in mind that 
uh, Native nations are sovereign. Our forms of government uh, long predate the colonization of the United States. And that, you know, true power for indigenous peoples doesn't just look like the ability to self-determine through the democracy that uh, was imposed upon us through a process of colonization and dispossession and displacement, but also to be able to self-determine as sovereign nations, to be able to self-govern. And I think in that regard, um, as well as, you know, truthfully in our ability to fully uh, express our power through the democracy, you know, we are still being limited in very significant ways. There's obviously still a fight uh, about the Line 3 pipeline in Anishinaabe territory in what's now Minnesota. There's ongoing concerns about the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is operating yes. without permits and also without the um, consent of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, among others. And, you know, there are still attacks on Native Americans' right to vote. You know, Native Americans got the, the right, Native American men got so, the right to vote in 1924. And we are still, um, you know, uh, our, our right to vote is still being limited yes. through a number of so, um, processes that you narrated. So let's talk about voting rights. Uh, Jenny, we don't often pay attention to states like Montana, but their Native Americans have a long history of playing a decisive role in quite close elections. They often vote Democratic. Uh, tell us what's happening there. Lawsuits have been filed against two laws that would severely restrict voting access to people who live on reservations in particular. Is there a chance those could be overturned? How serious is the situation in a place like Montana for Native American voting rights? Yeah, um, I think what we're seeing in Montana is the same kind of backlash we're seeing targeting um, marginalized communities nationwide in the rash of uh, voter suppression laws um, that we've seen in state legislatures across the country. Uh, for Indian country in particular, uh, we're looking at as many as 13 state legislatures with sizable native populations that have introduced over 100 bills aimed at disenfranchisement. And that's um, extraordinary when we look at states like Montana, where we have a native population there of roughly 7% across seven federally recognized tribes and who have gone to court and actually won for their rights um, as, as, um, as early as just last year. And one of those, um, one of those measures, collective ballot uh, collections, um, is now being challenged again in the courts. Um, that's one of the two voting laws that the Montana State Legislature introduced um, and got passed in May of 2021. The second one is same-day registration, which Native voters have been relying on in the state since 2005. And to put it into context of why these kinds of laws are, are important to Native voters, um, same day registration, having somebody take your ballot to the ballot box for you. It's simply because when you look at states like Montana that are incredibly rural, uh, similar to yes. North Dakota, Arizona, right? I mean, these are our native homelands um, where, where ballot boxes are hard to get to, gas, filling the yep. gas tank, it's hard to get to. You don't have a mailbox to to send in your ballot. And as we've seen in some cases where you might want to mail in your ballot, that gets challenged too. And so um, it's so, just, um, if you find any any way in any, any particular state where you can challenge a small but significant vote as we've seen of the native um, so, population, it will be attacked. So Jenny, you're mentioning court challenges. Julian, do you think Republicans understand the value of the Native American vote more than Democrats who benefit from it. In 2016, again in 2020, Trump was able to win over North Carolina's Lumbee tribe in North Carolina, as you predicted, I believe, ahead of last year's elections. Have Democrats been doing enough this year to make sure, number one, Native Americans continue to support them, and number two, that voting rights for those Native Americans are protected in places where they would vote Democratic? I believe it was Jenny, actually, who first uh, predicted that the Lumbee were going to vote for uh, Trump, yes, and that was apologies. because they were being promised uh, federal recognition, and Trump actually uh, held a rally in Robson County, which is where the Lumbee uh, resided, North Carolina. They voted for Obama in 2012 and then swung to the Republican Party in 2016 and 2020. Uh, and arguably, those kinds of decisions by Native voters who are often overlooked are actually very consequential in elections. Obviously, the Republicans carried North Carolina in the 2020 election, and it was a, it was a state that Democrats were hoping to pick up. 
You know, on the other side of things, if you look at Arizona, uh, where you have a number of tribes, the most populous of which in the nation actually is the Navajo Nation, which partially resides in Arizona, and about 84% of Navajo voters actually voted for Joe Biden and the Democratic Party in the 2020 election. And, you know, with, when you look at the incredibly slim, mar slim margin that decided you know, uh, which party would win the elections in Arizona. It was like 10,000, 15,000 votes. You know, those votes are very, very important. And what's kind of frustrating about all this, right, is that Republicans clearly understand that in particular states, the native vote is really important. And they are taking steps to limit the ability of native voters to participate in our democratic process because Native Americans tend to support the Democratic Party. On the other side, you know, the Democratic Party is continuing to waffle on questions of voting rights uh, for Native people and for, for all people, which is you know, a, a serious concern for um, you know, the outcomes that the party faces, as well as you know, the ability of people to participate in our democracy. Jenny, we've got 30 seconds left. Brief last answer. How frustrating is it for you to see people in the media, we're all guilty of this, including myself, focusing so much on black and Latino voters losing their voting rights, but not Native Americans? Well, as a media critic, I write about it all the time. <laughs> um, and it's Good. not perfect, but you know, um, I think that we're in a we're in a point in time where people are taking seriously for the first time the indigenous narrative and really understanding that you cannot tell the story of this country without our story as well. Well said. Julian yeah. Brave Noise Cat, Jenny Monet, thank you both for sharing your insights tonight. Appreciate it. Amid the fog of the chaotic exit from Afghanistan came an upsetting headline from the Wall Street Journal. It told the story of an Afghan man who was part of a rescue team sent in to recover then-Senator Joe Biden in 2008, along with then-Senators John Kerry and Chuck Hagel. Their helicopters had been grounded in a far-flung valley amid a blinding snowstorm. Like so many Afghans who helped American forces, his visa was stuck in processing and he wasn't able to get out. He feared for his life and appealed directly to the president who he had once helped. An appeal I shared with the White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain on this show the night of President Biden's landmark speech on the Afghan withdrawal. The Wall Street Journal is reporting today that an Afghan interpreter named Mohammed, who's hiding out in Kabul and who helped rescue then-Senator Biden in a snowstorm in Afghanistan in 2008, has this message for him. Hello, Mr. President. Save me and my family. Don't forget me here. Has President Biden seen this story about this interpreter? Do you have a response for Mohammed tonight? Uh, I don't believe the president has yet seen it. It broke late this afternoon. Uh, we are going to try to get every person. Now, I read in that story that he did not uh, finish the SIV process because of some complexity with his employer. It doesn't matter. We're going to cut through the red tape. Uh, we're going to find um, this gentleman whose name is an assumed name in that story. Uh, and we're going to get him and the other SIVs out. Tonight, some good news. The Wall Street Journal now reports after weeks in hiding, Aman Khalili said he and his family left Afghanistan last week, crossing the border into Pakistan thanks to help from military veterans living in Arizona. It's great news. America should never abandon the people who help us, especially when the cost to them and their families can be grim in a place like Afghanistan. But to be clear, it never should have come to this. It never should have had to be so rushed, so bedraggled in red tape. America, including during the Trump years, wasted precious time that could have been used to ferry to safety the Afghans who provided invaluable services at great risk to America's men and women serving abroad. Medal of Honor recipient Captain Florent Groberg was reunited with his translator on this show just last month and shared his excitement about finally being able to meet with him in person. Oh yeah, well, we're, we're, we're gonna figure it out. And, you know, I can't wait to, to see him. I can't wait to meet his, uh, his family. And uh, it's just, that's gonna be a very, very happy day for both of our families. And uh, it's gonna be one of those moments that you just never forget. I'm just glad they're getting a new chance at life. But it's worth remembering there are many more like them who have not been as fortunate. And they're owed more than just a debt of gratitude. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, and on Facebook. And I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Eastern live, right here on The Choice from MSNBC. For now, from me, good night.
Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.